It is 30 years since the consigning into history of the world's first communist state, home to an approaching 290 million people, the end of the Soviet Union. President Mikhail Gorbachev lauded in the West as an icon who'd ended the Cold War and the threat of nuclear war. But at home, his perestroika reforms designed to hold the Soviet Union together, leading to economic hardship, shortages of food and crime. The basis of communism that bound together the Union's 15 different republics under threat. Well, as Gorbachev tried to negotiate a new treaty, including the devolution of power, most in his government rebelled coup attempt as tanks rolled into Moscow. The coup thwarted largely due to this man, the new leader of the Russian Republic, Boris Yeltsin, who famously gave a rousing speech from a tank. Yeltsin cementing his place as a strong man, humiliating Gorbachev in a session of the Russian parliament and signing a decree banning the activities of the Communist Party on Russian soil. Gorbachev's power base lost, one by one, the republics turning towards on the independence. On the 25th of December 1991, Gorbachev officially announced his resignation and the red flag of the Soviet Union was lowered over the Kremlin. In this situation, which follows the establishment of the Commonwealth of Independent States, I hereby cease to act as the President of the Soviet Union. Well, since those dramatic moments, how have Russia and its former republics fared? Well, in today's programme, we revisit some of them. We're going to start with the main one, Russia itself, then to uh, Estonia with high-tech modernisation, to Ukraine, a country torn in two, and to Georgia as well, where critics say Russian influences remain through religion. And we'll even take you into space, to where a Soviet astronaut was stranded on board the Mir space station for 311 days. Well, our correspondents, James Andre, Sylvain Rousseau, and Ashraf Abid revisit the former republics of the Soviet Union for France 24. Mir, some 300 kilometers above Earth. Inside, Sergei Krikalev watches the USSR crumble. A ruined Russia inherits the Soviet space program and asks the cosmonaut to stay on and save the space station. At the time, they had to reduce Soyuz launches drastically, and they also absolutely had to keep someone on board the Mir station for maintenance, so they eventually asked Krikalev to stay on. Krikalev holds out for 311 days before Germany spends $24 million to send one of its citizens to the station, allowing Russia to return him. The last Soviet citizen has just become the first Russian space hero. Relief is what Sergei Krikalev, the cosmonaut stuck in space for nearly a year, must have felt this morning when a crew arrived to replace him. Krikalev left the Earth as a Soviet citizen. He returns as a Russian. On his right arm, he still bears the acronym USSR. When Krikalev lands, the communist empire has broken up into 15 independent countries. The Iron Curtain falls to reveal a fully blown economic crisis. People are faced with food shortages and hyperinflation. The Baltic states, immediately decide to free themselves from Russia's influence and turn to the EU. Estonia invests massively in new technologies and opens its market up, with three goals, eradicate corruption, bureaucracy and poverty. And that was a point where Estonia realized already 30 years ago that we can't continue doing things on the exact same way. Today, 99% of administrative procedures can be done online. Taxes are low and business is thriving. Today, Estonia has one of the largest number of startups per capita. Where business is easy, business will grow. Thanks to this zero red tape policy, startups make up 10% of Estonia's GDP. This former aerospace factory is now home to Paktum, a company that offers artificial intelligence based software that automatically renegotiates contracts between companies and their suppliers. I am pretending to be a supplier at the moment and the enterprise contacted me that maybe we can improve the contract for both sides. Some Estonian startups have enjoyed huge success, such as Skype, Bolt or TransferWise. The economy of Estonia has been increasing the most out of all the ex-Soviet Union countries and it is this effect of these uh, technology uh, companies that have created this value uh, via people, technical skills and, and having global ambition. 
Estonia joined the European Union and NATO in 2004. The USSR's former enemy is now on Russia's doorstep. Moscow couldn't stop the change, but retaliated three years later with the first cyber attack on a foreign state. These attacks later have become known in history as the first time that cyber attacks have been used for political goal. These attacks in 2007 showed both for the political decision makers as well as the people that cyber attacks can be as serious as physical attacks. And cybersecurity really is part of an overall security. Russia has never attacked a NATO member state militarily, but remains an intimidating neighbor with troops constantly massed on the border that hold major exercises every four years. A threat backed by a history of Russian military invasions in former Soviet republics. In 2008, Russian troops entered Georgia to defend a pro-Russian separatist minority in South Ossetia. The fighting lasted for nine days, caused over 1,000 deaths and displaced 150,000 people. Despite pressure from the international community, the Russian army never withdrew. Thirteen years later, kilometers of razor wire mark what has become a de facto border. I had a plot of land over there, but they locked me in with this fence and I lost it. My relatives don't come here because if they cross the line, they'll be arrested. I have no one here. This fence has ruined my life. 20 Russian military bases like this one dot the 350-kilometer-long demarcation line. We face um, a so-called borderization process. We face illegal detention of the people. Um, also, we um, face the military uh, drills on the ground. Russia is deployed on our land illegally, and they are occupying our region. They are uh, trying to have annexation policy on the ground. It is a threat for European security overall. Russia is also accused of working to undermine Western influence in the country. Sunday prayer is popular in this deeply religious society. After the independence, the Georgian Orthodox Church became the backbone of the Georgian state, cementing society around its traditional values. Religion has a very important place in my life. This church is very close to my heart. I've been coming here since I was four. The country should be free. It should be free of negative influence and restrictions, especially free of any foreign influence. 84% of Georgians define themselves as Orthodox Christians, and many feel their traditions are threatened by Western liberal values as the country prepares to formally apply for EU membership in 2024. Of course, the church supports the idea of Georgia becoming a Western democracy. And we are a part of Europe. But we shouldn't have to lose our culture to lose our traditions and replace them with other traditions. If a vast majority of Georgians support the country's bid to join the EU, most also reject the bloc's policies regarding LGBT rights. In July 2021, a pride march was cancelled amid protests and violence. Around 4,000 people were mobilized by church and they were therefore praying in front of the parliament. So it was a like peaceful anti-LGBT protest. But the one th around 1,000 people were this active uh, physical force which executed the operation and they were scattered all around the city. On that day, the EU flag were burnt uh, twice. For Georgi, there's more to the protests than homophobia. It's not about LGBT rights, it's, um, it, it is used, it is weaponized like to undermine the pro-Western path, but uh, the overarching idea is Russia trying to destabilize the country using LGBT rights to um, create this political tension in Georgia, uh, to attack the Western values because the LGBT rights is considered as something like coming from the West. For now, the Georgian government remains committed to its EU integration plans.
Kiev, Ukraine, thousands took to the streets in 2013 to ask for a path towards EU integration. The Maidan Square was occupied constantly for over three months, resulting in the resignation of the pro-Russian president. The Kremlin's response was swift and brutal. Paramilitary forces entered eastern Ukraine to support the anti-EU Russian-speaking population. Since Russia has annexed Crimea and Donbass, is locked in a latent war. Russia is already operating inside Ukraine. What other proof do you need? When we capture prisoners of war, they have Russian passports. This former factory in Advika is on the front line. The enemy is just 100 meters away. Here, the fighting never actually stops. They have no strategy. They shoot at anything, at any moment. At the end of 2021, Russia started massing troops on the border. Observers worry about an invasion, but these soldiers are dubious. They say an attack is imminent, that Russians are amassing their forces. I don't think it's going to happen. They'd lose too many men. The Ukrainian government has no means to force the Russians out, so it has decided to fight back on the ideological front. A law voted in 2015 bans all traces of the Soviet era. Streets and cities named after Bolshevik leaders have to be rebranded. Toresk, a declining minor town, is a good example. In accordance with the Ukrainian law on the condemnation of the communist and national socialist or Nazi totalitarian regimes, and prohibiting the propagation of their symbols. Zerzhensk is renamed Toretsk. Zerzhensk, named after Felix Zerzhinsky, founder of the infamous Cheka, the communist political police responsible for the killing of hundreds of thousands of Soviet citizens. That was a person, Iron Felix as they called him. Why that name? Well, I suppose those were his character traits. Toughness. In Russia, his statues were torn down three decades ago. In Toresk, they stood proudly until 2015. At the time, Andrei Grudkin, an activist, realized how little people actually knew about Zerzhinsky. One girl said he was a great Russian general. One woman said he was a Soviet statesman who looked after children. It really showed how people don't know their history. For Andre, de-Sovietization is necessary. There are symbols of totalitarianism, statues of people who tortured and killed millions of their own citizens, who created man-made famines, who sent people to rot in the camps. Should we have waited a few more years or debated whether these were actually good guys and should stay in place? No way. I think everything was done absolutely correctly. While statues are being removed in Ukraine, Russians are putting up new ones. This is a monument to Joseph Stalin. It was put up on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the Soviet people's victory over Nazi Germany, a tribute to the Generalissimo, the commander-in-chief, the one who saved the world from fascism. Alexei Zorov's next step is to build a museum dedicated to the dictator. Here, there will be a building, 20 meters by 14. It will be a big building of around a thousand square meters. It's our history. It's the history of the Soviet Union and of Russia. It's the history of every person who lives in Russia. We're fans. Stalin's my hero. I've been waiting to see a monument like this for a long time. At last, his achievements are acknowledged. What do you think of Stalin? He's really interesting. See, she's interested. He's the Generalissimo, right? It's unbelievable. We were passing by and we saw the Stalin monument. Why would you do that? My great-grandfather died in a camp. He was executed in 1938. 
bloodthirsty tyrant to some, war hero who defeated the Nazis to others, Stalin is a divisive figure in Russia. Alexei knows where he stands, despite the fact his own grandfather was killed in the Stalinist purges. It wasn't Stalin who came to arrest him, but local officials. Why should Stalin be held responsible? Should Putin be held responsible for what I do, for example, because he's head of state? The communist ideology is very much out of fashion, but most Russians love a strong man. A fact Vladimir Putin, who has ruled Russia for 20 years, understood early on. We really do not want to burn bridges. But if someone perceives our good intentions as indifference or weakness, and himself intends to finally burn or even blow up these bridges, then he should know that Russia's response will be asymmetrical, rapid and brutal. <coughs> The master of the Kremlin is bent on filling the void left 30 years ago when the USSR collapsed. With his aggressive tactics, he has managed to place Russia back at the center of the diplomatic scene and set the stage for a renewed Cold War. James André, Sylvain Rousseau and Ashraf Abid revisiting the former republics of the Soviet Union for France 24. And well, that's all from this week's edition. Don't forget, of course, you can catch it and all the previous editions as well on our website, france24.com. Thanks very much for watching. More news coming up shortly.